One. Um, I believe they have our slides. I am so free from the message that Pastor Hannah just ministered, particularly because when you're in a Pentecostal, spirit-filled church environment, there's always this balance between the intellect and the spirit. But praise the Lord, I could be me today. <laughs> I also want to thank Pastor Poju and his lovely wife, Toen, for inviting us here again. We're super excited. We're also excited to be ambassadors on behalf of Dr. Winston, which means that I know I'm not here on my own accord, but I've been sent on assignment. So I thank you so much for that. And as um, already been introduced, my lovely husband of 25 years in marriage heading to 26 in April. Um, he is the best half of me. Mm -hmm. And so I'm so excited that we're going to be uh, talking about business strategies today. So I did send my slides over. So if we could, um, I'm just gonna pray real quick and then we'll get started. Hallelujah, Father God, we just come before you and we magnify your name. You and you alone are worthy, Lord God. Father, we consider this place holy ground, a place where you can speak and we will hear, a place where we will yield our will to your will so that thy perfect will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord God, we ask that ears are open, eyes are open, and that people will receive the engrafted word of God that will be unhindered and unchecked by any outside force. We thank you that as the word is released, that none of it will fall to the ground, but it will go forth and accomplish that which it is sent to accomplish. We thank you for this, and we consider it done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we'll start with the first slide. We could go to the second slide. So we've already been introduced. What a beautiful couple they are. All right, we could go to the next slide. So I'm going to have my husband ask this question because I'm going to be a little bit biased, right? So I'm going to let the guy talk about sports. Good morning. So the headline is, Nigeria defeats Brazil to win the World Cup. Woo, woo, woo. You laugh. Uh, Why are you laughing? Are you not rooting for Nigeria? Or, have, or do you have such little faith that this is possible? <laughs> All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna cha to change one word here. Is that instead of being a coach, I've been educating myself a little bit more on football, international football, you are the president of the Nigerian Football Federation. So you know that you're going to be up against, you have a match against Brazil. So what is your strategy that you would use to defeat Brazil? So what would you, what would you need to know? Or what things would you need to think about if you're going to defeat Brazil? So you want to... Now, so these are sort of rhetorical questions. So among the things that you would need to consider, this is just an example to set the environment on what's going to follow in terms of how we talk about strategy. So you need to know who your manager is and what the manager is capable of. You need to know who your players are, both offensive players and defensive players. You need to know a little bit about your goalie, how good is your goalie, right? And then... You also need to know about your competition. So you need to know who are the good players on the Brazilian team, who's their manager, what plays do they normally run, how, how good of an offense do they have, how good of a defense do they have. And so when you, when you do this, when you think about your skills and your abilities and you think about Brazil's teams and Brazil's ability, then, what, then you understand your strengths and your weaknesses and their strengths and their weaknesses, then you can develop a plan for the match. And that plan for the match is going to try to highlight the things that you're good at against the things that they're weak at, because they're going to be doing the same thing. They're going to be trying to come at your weaknesses. So you're going to have to come up with a plan on how you're going to bolster up the areas where you're weak. And so the other thing you need to know is like, do you have any injuries? So these things have to do with one, what your teams are, 
Are you playing at home? Are you playing away? And then, uh, again, who your opponent is. And that's going to give you a rough idea about the general environment and then about your specific strengths and weaknesses and your competitive strengths and weaknesses. Now, I know you thought that was a funny question. And how many of you ask yourself, can you be the champion? How many things are you believing for, whether in your professional life, whether it's in business, whether it's your personal life, that people laugh at you when you say, Nigeria is going to beat Brazil? That might not be the question, but to ask yourself, can Nigeria beat Brazil, is the same as asking, can I actually accomplish the goals, and do I have a strategy to accomplish the goals, even though people will laugh at me. So here's the foundational scripture. It says, many plans are in a man's heart, but the counsel of the Lord will stand. So when you think about strategy, I want you to recognize that you can have a plan, but there's a way in which God is going to lead you for you to be able to accomplish that plan. So what is a strategic plan? This is a little bit of a wordy slide, but basically a strategic plan reflects in an organization's mission, the vision, the values, its goals, objectives, and action plan. So a lot of times people say, okay, do you have a strategic plan? And you're wondering, well, what exactly is a strategic plan? It has all those components, but it's not only internally focused, it's also externally focused. And it has to be action-oriented. So when you're developing a plan, you have to look at the environment and you have to ask yourself, is it feasible? What are the barriers to entry? What are the challenges that I'll face to actually make sure that this plan can come to pass? And you have to determine the most effective strategy to accomplish that plan. Now, I know we've done our praise, and I know we've done our shouting. But if you listen to Pastor Hannah's message, it's about execution, right? So you have to have a clear strategy for what you're believing God for, and you have to have a plan as to how to execute that. So basically, the essential um, from this definition are really three things. Where are you? You have to take a real assessment, right? I want to be debt free if that was to be a personal goal. And so the question is, where are you right now? You know what I've figured out with business people and particularly church business people? And if I could be real, particularly black church business people. It's I want to be debt free, but I don't know what's in my bank account. Right? So you have to figure out, well, where am I? How much do I owe? How much do I spend? And what I want to accomplish, what is it going to take for me to get there? Where are you going? Are you clear on where you're going? And how and what is the best way for you to get there? So a strategic plan for a believer. Strategic plan for a believer is... You have a plan, but the more, most important part of your plan is that your plan involves hearing from the Holy Spirit. So for a believer, hearing the voice of God is what makes the plan strategic for you. Is that clear? Hearing the voice of God is what makes it strategic for you. And so we're going to talk a little bit about shifting your paradigm when you think about strategic planning. And if the devil is telling you this is a boring subject, it's because he's busy stealing from you. Okay? So it's really important. So when we think about this, there are several different strategic paradigms. So what is a paradigm? A paradigm is literally a collection of beliefs. So you have built a method and a mode of thinking about what things are and how do you believe. It's a framework that you've created by your experiences. So you could have a group of people that believe things like this. America is a place where there's a land of opportunity, right? That's a set of beliefs, right? You could have a belief which is, oh, the government is corrupt and I'll never be able to grow my business to the level I need to go. Those are paradigms, right, that you have developed and so what it does, it creates your worldview, 
and it will determine what type of plan and strategy you would actually develop to accomplish your goal. And so here are different paradigms. Paradigm number one. You hear this particularly, the, ne the next slide. Yeah, paradigm number one. Vision is most important. How many of you have heard that as a leader? If you don't have a vision, the people perish, right? We talk about that all the time. So in an organization, we always think it's all about the visionary leader. And it says, without strong visionary leader, no strategy will be executed effectively. And so here's an example where you see Joshua and the conquest of Jericho. And you'll see it, you could either use these slides or you could put up the scripture, but in Joshua 6, the Lord said unto Joshua, see, I have given you Jericho. So it's the same thing with your business. See, I've made your business a multi-million dollar business, not in Naira, but in dollars. Oh, no, 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 let's do pounds, right? <laughs> so, so now, he says, I'm going to make your business a multi-billion dollar business. And so we heard what Pastor Poju said, your ability to see is what activates your faith to actually accomplish that goal, right? It's the same thing with strategic planning in business. And so God showed Joshua that he was going to be able to defeat Jericho. So that's one paradigm where you might say, it's all about seeing. All right, we're going to go to a second paradigm. Paradigm number two, execution is most important. Having a vision for what you want is not enough. Vision without execution is hallucination. How and many of you have Thomas heard that? Edison. That's from Thomas Edison. <laughs> so, so, here's, so here's another uh, biblical example, and Pastor Hannah really preach the pants off this already <laughs> when he talks about David. We were on the same wavelength and hearing from the Lord. So somebody in here needs to hear this and receive it in your heart. So it's the same thing when, when David goes out to defeat Goliath, um, and this was the example that Hannah said, he was weighed down by somebody else's vision about how to do it. So they had their strategy and their approach to do it, but guess what? That didn't fit David. And this goes back to the points that we were making about when you develop your strategy and your plan, you have to determine your own strengths and weaknesses. And so while that armor might have worked for Saul, it certainly wasn't going to work for David. And David was wise enough to understand that doesn't work for me. So, and I'm not going to go back and preach what he said because he preached it here. And it's basically the same illustration that, that, that Saul... Saul's approach and Saul's strategy was not going to be an effective strategy for David. So you have to be wise enough to recognize what works for you and be able to then have the courage to just be you mm -hmm. and to go and walk in the fullness of that. And whether you're in a church environment or in a work environment, these, this is where sometimes there's a divide between the visionary leader and the managerial staff, right? So the pastor will say, the vision is everything, and the people who have to do the work, yeah, well, I've got to execute it, so it's not everything, right? So sometimes we think that one area is more important than the other. But let's look at paradigm number three. It says, higher order of thinking. The problem that exists in this world cannot be solved by the level of thinking that created them. So how many of us who are believers, we also believe that the Holy Spirit provides us a higher level of thinking to solve problems. And so you might have these different ways in which you think about strategic planning. You might say, oh, I'm going to come up with a plan and I just have to be really audacious about the vision. Or, oh, I'm going to come up with a plan and I just have to execute better. Or, oh, I need to come up with a plan that is supernatural. And so let's go to the next slide to show you a biblical example of that. And so in Isaiah 55, a lot of times we hear people talk about this as if it's a way of escape, but it's not. It says in Isaiah 55, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord, because it's higher than your ways, right? So for some reason, we believe we can escape planning because God's got it. But how many of you heard Pastor Keon where he says, what you did in the wilderness where manna, okay, 
All right, I'm discovering new places. <laughs> um, what, what, you, what, what you were able to do in the wilderness where manna came is a very different requirement than what's required in Canaan. Right? So that's what he was saying here. So you want to make sure that when you're thinking that God's thoughts are higher than your ways, um, than your thoughts, or higher than, than your ways, that it's important for you to realize that you need all three. You need visionary leadership, you need execution, and you also need to be able to receive the knowledge and wisdom from the Holy Spirit to be able to do planning. Let's go to the next slide. When you look at leadership and management, right, so when you look at this slide, um, what it really shows is that change and complexity, the level of change and complexity, it's okay, he's going to come back, but I'm going to talk a little while, so if you see him sitting there, don't be distracted, okay? Just, just focus. I'm talking right now. He's good. He's good. Trust me. He's going to come right back. Um, and so when you look at leadership and change and complexity, if you look at this slide, you have leadership on one axis and you have management on the other. Where do you find the most successful organizations or should I say the most successful lives, right? It's at the point where your leadership ability, your ability to have vision and your ability to manage is really where at that intersection is where you end up having the most successful organizations. So a lot of times you'll have people where they have big organizations and it grew, the vision was great, and because the vision wasn't enough to sustain it, eventually that organization becomes either stalemate, right? It's not growing as fast, now you're having challenges that you wouldn't have if you really had the right managerial responsibilities outlined. So let's go to the next slide. Oh, this is my husband's, okay. So the, the next one is the same, strategy and execution. And so when you look at strategy and execution, what happens is if you only have strategy, if you only have vision, you'll end up with that growth wave, right? Or if you're on the weaker end of a vision, you're fighting fires. So if you're running an organization where all you're doing is just fighting fires, what it basically means is you don't have a strategy and you don't have a plan to execute a strategy, right? So you're fighting fires. If you're on the higher end, which is you have a strategy and you're strong at executing the strategy, you can predict what's going to happen. You've already planned it. So this is when the Lord says, before the foundation of the earth was even established, he knew what the end was going to be. So if we truly are Christ-centered believers and we want to be like Christ, you got to plan the foundation. You have to be able to see the end from the beginning. So it's scriptural, right? Now, if you look at the, the third slide, for those of you who are still not convinced because you think, oh, I just need to be a really strong visionary or I just have to be a good execution, vision plus execution creates wealth. So a lot of us says, you know, oh, the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. Right? We know that scripture. The wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. Why haven't you gotten it yet? Because you've not developed a plan on how to get it. Right? So if we're starting 2022 and that's your confession, remember, how will Nigeria win the World Cup? How are you going to make sure that the vision that was laid out for you by God the beginning of this year is accomplished? It's not just coming in here and praising the Lord. You have to put pen to paper and have a real plan to be able to create wealth. All right, let's go to the next slide. So here is a, a thing that shows you that paradigm influences your strategy. So you have two examples where you've heard this uh, before. You know, is a glass half full or half empty? And some people say, oh, if it's half empty, you must be a pessimist. If it's half full, you must be an optimist. But if I'm a chemist or if I'm a scientist, it's always full. Because the part that doesn't have water has air, right? So it's a function as to how you're looking at it. Many of you might have heard the story of a salesman 
They send him to Africa. I don't know why the salespeople always go in Africa. But they went to Africa, and in this story, the salesman shows up, and he says, oh, my gosh, nobody's wearing shoes. So this is not a good market for us to be in, right? Then they send another salesman, and he shows up in Africa. He says, nobody is wearing shoes. Please send me all your inventory. Same context, but two different people looking at the situation two different ways. So what is your paradigm? What is it that you believe you cannot do or what is it that you've made up in your mind is an impossibility for you to accomplish your goal? One could be, I don't have enough money. I don't have enough connections. I don't have enough education. Can the devil give you a list of all of you can'ts? So we want to change your paradigm and develop a plan for you to be able to get there. So let's go to the next slide that talks about the levels of strategic planning. So one level, and my husband, if, if you could explain this slide, because I think he does such a marvelous job with this. In managing an organization, and even in managing your life, I have a daughter, and so I always tell her this, don't come to me with a problem. I know you could decide that I'm a bad mother, but the last time I checked, Jesus said the same thing. I finished my work. Don't come to me with your problems, right? So the way I read my Bible, I'm just trying to be like Jesus. So as you're leading an organization, you have people who say, oh, I'm going to come and just tell you that there's a problem. Something is broken. Honey, could you explain this one? He, he does a masterful job at this. Everybody wants to be the boss, right? Everybody wants to be in charge. But you got to ask yourself, like, how do you get to be in charge, right? So... When I talk to my employees uh, when I was in the corporate environment about their own development, there's layers of, of thinking. So this first level is that there's some people that don't even know that they have a problem. So you need to fire them. Because if they can't recognize they have a problem, you don't need them in your organization. Then there's other people then that can recognize there's a problem, but they want to bring it to you. Right? Well, at least they know there's a problem. So this is progress over the person that doesn't even recognize there's a problem. Then there's a person that recognizes there's a problem and will come to you not only with the problem, but they will recommend alternatives as to how to solve that problem. So that's a better employee than the one that just brings you the problem. Right? But then the best employee is a person that can identify that there's a problem can come up with some alternatives and then recommend what you should implement. That person is definitely a keeper. And so a lot has to do in terms of like, if you look at yourself in your own environment, in your own work environment, are you a person that doesn't recognize your problem or are you a person that is recommending solutions to the situations that will make the organization function better? So we're now in a situation where it seems like the world is telling us that we have a problem. And the problem to them is COVID. Right? And so there are people who are saying, there's very little that I can do because there's COVID. Well, Dr. Winston, in the midst of COVID, did not stop his operation and has done more build out projects during COVID and have seen more growth during COVID that if he had listened that COVID was going to slow things down and he repeated that, that would have been his reality. But there's so many people who are starting new businesses, right? When we were starting school, think about it. God's been telling the church, and I know some people think that it's demonic, that the church needs to look at technology, that things are changing. But some people, some churches are like, no, the devil is in the technology. And I say, well, give me your cell phone, right? And so they're, no, 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 don't do that. And so what happens is the church is now suffering significant loss because they never changed. They never observed what was going on. They had a fixed mindset of possibilities and didn't see that God was doing a new thing. Okay, so you think I'm on the verge of blasphemy for those of you who are pastors in the house. So I'll give you another example that's scriptural. 
You had the Sadducees and the Pharisees that was looking for a deliverer and a saver, and when he showed up, they didn't even notice him, right? So even in the Bible, it shows that if you have a fixed mindset, you will miss opportunities to get you to your destiny. So the goal is for you to have an innovative mindset, to be open to what God is doing, and to really not be so focused on how it's been for the last 20 years, but how God is going to show you what the next 20 years are going to be. And the Bible said that. Ooh, I caught him in my hand. I'm a, definitely a Jamaican or a Nigerian. <laughs> so, so if you think about it, he says the Holy Spirit will show you things to come. He didn't say he's going to remind you of your past. That's the devil. So when you show up and you say, well, we used to do it this way. It always worked this way and you never think about the future, then how much are we enabling the Holy Spirit to reveal new things, places that you've never been that will seem grossly uncomfortable, but it is the plan of God to take you to your wealthy place. So here are some steps to shifting your paradigm. The first thing you have to do is unfreeze what you have learned. You literally have to put it in a box. So I'll give you a personal story. I hope my mother won't mind. But my mother has two children from the same man, but was never married, right? So thank the Lord, I don't have the sins of my foreparents. I have a child with a man that I was married to. So that's the past, but this is a story to give you an example, right? So my mom, who lives with me, has a way of thinking about marriage relationships. She's a strong woman. You keep your own money. You have your own way. You do your own thing. So this is what I said to my mom. And how long have you been married, mom? With all due respect. Because if I do it your way, I kind of can imagine, right, what the outcome would be. I had to unfreeze what I was taught growing up. You have to unfreeze that, oh, I don't have enough education, so my opportunities are limited. You have to unfreeze that. And then you have to change your state, right? You have to change how you look at your situation. And then you have to refreeze, which is, this is called the renewing of the mind, right? You have to say, all of my comfortable friends who know that they'd rather you stay back with them than for you to move forward are going to tell you things to keep you where you are. You have to be willing to let go of that and refreeze a new thought so that you can see things differently. So this is what the Bible says in Isaiah 43, 19. He says, behold, I'm going to do a new thing. How many of you want to receive a new thing? If it's new, have you had it before? Okay, if it's new, have you had it before? No. So if you are desiring to do a new thing, to develop a new strategy, it says, now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So let's talk about strategic planning. When you look at what happened with Isaac, it was in the land of famine, and even in the time of famine, he prospered to the degree that the Philistines envied him. So what is it that God is going to do that's new in your life that's going to make you uncomfortable? What is it that he's going to do that's going to make you uncomfortable? For some of you, it might be going to school. For some of you, it might be writing a book and you don't know how to write. For some of you, it might be to speak, and you don't know how to speak, right? Moses didn't know how to speak. He told God he didn't know how to speak. So what is it that God is telling you to do that you're going to have to develop a new strategy? So the next slide, it's important for you to think about the opportunities and what it is that you need to do. And there are different kinds of opportunities. A lot of times when you look at nations, like developing nations, what you find is there's two kinds of entrepreneurial 
uh, endeavors. One is necessity-based entrepreneurship. This is basically, you see people on the street copying what already exists, right? So they're gonna do the fake Gucci bag, they're gonna sell you the phone, they're gonna give you a watch, you know, all these kinds of, it's already been created and they're simply trying to find a hustle, right? So you go and you'll say, oh, it's very entrepreneurial. Everybody has a little market. Everybody's doing all of that. Would you believe that necessity-based entrepreneurship does not create the level of wealth to set a nation free? It doesn't. So the next level is opportunity entrepreneurship. And opportunity entrepreneurship is one where you can see an opportunity, see a problem, and solve that problem which means people don't even know sometimes that they have a problem. And when you solve that problem, they might not even be convinced that that's the right thing for them to, to do. I remember people would say, I'm not getting in a car of somebody I don't know, Uber. I'm not gonna buy something on the internet and I've not tried it on, right? So they saw an opportunity way before other people saw it and built a strategy to capture that demand and now it's like second nature. But in the beginning, it really wasn't. So that's what's called disruptive innovation. You're looking at problems that people have, you're asking the Lord for you to be that problem solver, he's downloading for you a vision and a strategy as to how to be first in the marketplace. Say first in the marketplace. So if you're a leader, you have to be able to, a leader in your life, a leader in your household, a leader in your organization, you have to recognize that you create the culture that you want to have exist. And culture shows up in a lot of different ways. Like we use words, but like what does it mean? So there's a culture based on behavior. Oh, we love for you to innovate. I know, I keep coming over here. It must be something good over here. Yeah, You're yeah, in red, yeah. the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you, you, you have this, this, this culture that's created, but you as a leader, whether it's in your home or whether it's at work or in your personal life, what is that culture? It's a function of your behavior. So if you say to me, you want to innovate and you want to be able to do all these things, oh, and we have abundance, but you're always like, oh, I can't get that. You can't afford that. We're not going to do that. You're creating a behavior that's reinforcing a culture that we can't afford that and we don't have abundance. That's culture, right? Through behavior. Another way in which a leader creates culture is through symbols, right? So a thing would be something like, oh, I don't want anybody to know we have any money. So you can't wear that when you're going here or you can't do that, right? So a symbol would be, I can't live in that house, I can't drive that car because no one is gonna think I'm holy enough, they're gonna think I have too much money, or whatever, right? These are symbols that you're showing as a culture that you're creating to believe and reinforce what you believe. Systems. So you could say that I am empowering my children to make a decision but they have to come to you for every dime they spend. So the decision-making systems do not line up with the culture you're wanting to create. So just know that when they say people don't do what you say, they do what you do, right? It's the same thing. So if you're trying to create change in your life and develop a strategy, it's gonna be really important that your behavior and your symbols as well as your, your um, systems reflect that. So here's an example of a strategic decision that went bad for Blockbuster and really good for Netflix. So what happened is, how many of you, did you have Blockbuster here? Yes, no? Okay, so I'll, I'll describe to you what Blockbuster is. Blockbuster is a place, what they would call, where they would have videotapes for all the latest movies and you would go to the store, you could buy your popcorn, and you would go and you would pick up your movies. And it was like a real experience. It was kind of like a Starbucks experience back in the day. The only problem is you would go to the store and there would be no movies left on the rack. 
because they would only carry so much. Netflix actually proposed to Blockbuster that they should really go away from this, you know, hard VHS tapes. I'm dating myself, young folks, but there was VHS and 8-track, yep, that's how old I am. <laughs> Proud of it. Ask John Hanna, I'm a be it. So, so what happens is, with the Netflix, they went to Blockbuster and told them, hey, this new thing is coming. You might want to think about, you know, purchasing and investing in this technology. They said no. Do you see what happened with Blockbuster? They were a $6 billion company that went bankrupt in six years. And Netflix went from less than a billion dollars in six years to 2.2 billion, and now in 2022 is a multi, multi billion dollar company. How many of you look at that slide and see your life? If you were to do a trend line on where you started and where you're supposed to be, are you going bankrupt? because you don't want to change and you don't have a strategy as to how to accomplish your goal. It's a real deal. So let's look at some examples. It says every barren land is a vision waiting for a visionary. So every gap in your life is waiting for a visionary. Let me show you what happened with Dubai. So if you think it's not possible to turn a desert from 1991 to a world's attraction in 2017, how many of you want to go to Dubai? Because you've heard about it. The world has heard of Dubai. Well, in 1991, that's what it looked like. Are you the visionary that's going to change Nigeria? The Bible says, I'm looking to and fro for a man who would stand in the gap. It took one man to change the economy. It took Peter deciding to launch out into the boat to change the economy of Capernaum. It took Isaac to decide that he was going to sow in the land of famine to change what was going on. You actually can have a plan and a strategy to develop that change. I got two minutes. Praise you, Jesus. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So in order for you to be able to do this, you must build an agile organization. One of the things that's happened um, as a result of colonialism and slavery is that we've created this hierarchical structure where you don't move unless I tell you to move. So you have people, I mean, I show up to the airport and it takes 20 people to make a decision. It's like crazy, okay? Um, we, we got our visa on arrival and there were three steps, all of which was manual. You go to the U.S., they literally scan your passport, and in a nanosecond, you're going through. It's a function of your capacity to have, you can create that idea. You don't have to complain about it. You could create that idea. So a way of thinking about creating and building an agile organization is you've got to really decide if you want a command and control organization. Because if it's a command and control, the organization will only grow to the extent that the head person is available to make a decision. So when the lights go off, and when something goes crazy, and they can't react because they're waiting for the decision maker, then what happens is you have not built in agility in the organization or in your life to be able to achieve the level of strategy that you need. So really think about how do you achieve your strategic outcome by making sure you decentralize decisions, but at the same time have the level of unified control in, in achieving that vision. A lot of visionaries says, if the people would only do what I asked them to do, well, it's not going to happen by accident. You literally have to plan for them to do what it is that you want them to do. You have to delegate and build that. So the next slide. In order for you to be able to build an agile organization and really think about strategy, you have to understand trends. Would you believe there is a magazine like Forbes, uh, please, can you guys give me like four minutes? 
because I'm, I'm like getting out of breath with 26 seconds. Is that okay? Can I get four minutes? Okay, thank you so much. The Lord is going to bless you for your fasting and dedication to a couple more minutes. So there is an org there's a, a, a publishing company um, similar to like Forbes and Fortune that assesses black companies in the United States, and it's called the BE100, Black Enterprise 100. There was a longitudinal study that was done over 40 years where it shows that all of those companies, over 40 years, most of them did not exist. Did you hear me? Most of them did not exist. And do you know why they didn't exist? They failed to look at trends. So sometimes the enemy of success is, is what do you say, the enemy of great? Good. Is the enemy. No, better is the enemy of good, right? Good, and good, good is, is the, the enemy, enemy of right, be best, right. better. Good is the enemy of better, and better is the enemy of best. So what happens is that if you're doing well, you've got a little bit of money, you, think, you, you know, even though you don't have it all, your, your net income is still negative, but you've got a little money, you could drive a nice car or whatever, you think that you're doing well. So you don't have to adjust your life, right? The organization is growing, so you don't have to adjust. All is well. No. You have to look at your business model and to see whether or not, and challenge it. It's better for you to challenge your business model than for the competition to do it. By the time the competition challenges you, by the time the next church is built on the corner, by the time your next restaurant is built on the corner because you fail to listen to your customer, you fail to increase the technological advancement that's going on, you fail to really train your employees, guess what? The competition comes and you no longer exist. Right? So looking at your business model. So how do you define your business model? The way you define your business model is to really look at what do you offer the customer? That's right. You are not always right. What do you offer the customer? Don't curse the customer out. Um, what is your value proposition? How is the value proposition created? It's not just created from top down, it's created as part of your systems and your structures and your behavior. And why is the organization profitable? Do you know that sometimes people generate a profit and they don't know why? They don't realize the activity that's actually generating that profit? You have to be able to really assess what is causing that level of profitability. So here are the steps to strategic planning. As you could see, you have the vision. Many people in church have this. I know where I want to go. This is what I'm believing for in 2022. You might even have the mission, right? You might even have the values. It's I'm going to do this by faith. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to do all of that. But then you have all these things going on and you've not really allocated priorities to that vision or priorities to that mission. So I want to challenge you to develop a priority list that says, if I'm going to be debt free, that's my vision. My mission is, I'm, you know, I'm not going to buy any clothes. What, what's my priority? I'm going to save 10%. I'm going to tithe. I'm going to list your priorities. And then what are your goals and your actions? What steps am I going to take? Because those strategic initiatives require you to have clear steps as to how you're going to get there, right? So you want to make sure that you do that. And then, um, I'm going to have my husband give you a biblical example as to how uh, God did strategic planning. Planning is all in the Bible, all over the Bible. God is planning, has plans everywhere. And uh, one of the key places, he even tells us in Habakkuk 2.2, take the vision, write it down, make it plain, make it so plain that you can read it while you're running. All right, so you want to, so a lot of times we don't, want a plan, and, and, and you, you need to write the plan, and you need to write it down in detail, and God will give you all of the details that you need. When we started the business school, we came to Dr. Winston, we had a plan, we told him it was going to take two years, right? So he said, well, let me go pray about that. He went and he prayed about it, he said, God told me to tell you to do it in two months, right? So none of the elements of the plan changed, but when Pastor Hannah was talking about, but the power of God came on and accelerated the time. Because the big thing that we needed to, to launch the school and why we told them it was two years is we had to develop a curriculum. So God took my wife on the internet. We went through the internet. We found a curriculum on the internet that was exactly what Dr. Wilson had asked us to do. It was, was microfiche at the library. It wasn't <laughs> internet. 
Well, I feel it was in it. But anyway, but we found the curriculum, and it was exactly tailored to the 10-month program that Dr. Winston had instructed us to, to develop. So that redeemed the two years, and then it was just a matter of execution at that point. So it's important to, to know what all the details are, and then, then God can operate to either accelerate the time or to have you find favor. That was the other thing that, that was the result. We found favor with, with, with everyone that we came to. Now, if you don't think that God is in the details, right, and I'm not going to go through it, but in Exodus... He spends five chapters giving Moses the details on how to build out the sanctuary. Five chapters in the Bible on details. He told him, he gave him a blueprint. He told him what the different structures were. He gave him the dimensions of the structures. He told him what instruments they needed. He told him what materials they needed to use. He gave him the financial plan, how to finance it. And he also gave him a personnel plan. So he gave him all of the details related to building out the sanctuary. So God is in the details. Amen. Amen. So the last slide is seek God's wisdom. And, you know, when we talk about seeking God's wisdom, when God's wisdom show up because we, you know, like my husband always says, the spirit of stupor was on us, we sometimes don't recognize his wisdom. And so it's important for you to, to receive his wisdom by faith. The same way how you receive your salvation by faith is to receive wisdom by faith. And the last thing that I'll say in this as we close is there's a wonderful scripture um, that says, he who waits upon the Lord shall renew his strength. He shall mount upon wings like eagles. He shall run and not be weary. He should walk and not faint. God is not unjust that he will forget your labor of love, that he will be unfaithful to the vision and the desires that he's placed in your heart. But as my husband said, when you plan your ways and the Lord orders your steps, if you start putting the plan in place and you start identifying the action steps, he's going to come and he's going to take that stone that you throw and he's going to deliver it right on point. So I'm going to encourage you to not be lazy and lackadaisical about this thing called the destiny and plan that God has for your life. It is not something to take lightly. He will ask you to give account of the things that he's placed in your heart and the desires that he's placed in you. Whether it's for a nation, whether it's for your family, your community, or for your life, it's important for you to plan strategically, not only on the vision, but the steps that you need to take to get there. I hope that you are blessed. I hope you saw this as a form of ministry <laughs> and, that, and that God wants to make sure that it's not just faith alone, but faith with works. And so you'll be able to accomplish. I love Pastor Soji for thanking me for, <laughs> but thank you so much. Um, you want me to ask questions or no? We're done. Okay, go eat and I will see you tonight. Thank you.